Welcome to the web series, Exploring 9-11, The World Before and After, a production of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum. I'm Clifford Channon. I'm speaking today with Bruce Lawrence, a professor of religion and director of the Islamic Studies Center at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Lawrence is also the editor of Messages to the World, the Statements of Osama bin Laden. This book brings together the most important statements and documents that were issued by bin Laden or in his name, and that together make a statement about how he sees the world and why he has done what he's done. Before we get into the statements themselves, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the man himself, Osama bin Laden. He was born uh, to uh, an extraordinarily successful Yemeni immigrant who had the major construction company in Saudi Arabia, the favor of the Saudi royal family. This is a young man who was born into privilege and raised in privileged circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's true. The, um, the first look you get is that this person had nothing except a life of uh, pleasure, uh, opportunity, uh, connected as much to the Western world as to the Arab world. Uh, but there is a cloud within that otherwise seemingly bright horizon, and that, uh, that cloud has to do with his relationship to his father, his father's early death, um, if you believe some people, also the death of his older brother, um, and then, of course, the circumstances, the political circumstances of his own home country uh, that shaped and reshaped him. So it, w it was an, an, an idyllic uh, it, moment, if you will, to look at him just simply as a profile of a wealthy uh, Saudi Yemeni uh, parent. But in another sense, there was lurking within it uh, the possibility of a different turn. Now, he was active in the bin Laden uh, construction companies and industries. He had a role uh, and some responsibilities in his early years uh, as he was just living a normal uh, life at that point. Well, except they were minor roles. And, mm -hmm. and what's really important to recognize is that he was one of several, several children, over 50 children that Mohammed bin Laden had. And the only one by a, a wife, a Syrian wife, whom some people say was Alawi. Uh, for those who don't know, Alawi is not only a minor group, but it's uh, even a group that's outside the Shi'i in terms of their acceptability as um, representing Muslim orthodoxy, or if you will, the mainstream Muslim world. So in one sense, he had um, a different relationship to his father than, say, his older half-brothers, such as Salem, who was groomed to be the successor, in fact, was a successor uh, to Mohammed bin Laden when he died in a plane crash. Now, Osama bin Laden, uh, among his family members, had a reputation quite early for religious observance and piety. This is something that uh, marked him as distinct from some of his uh, siblings. Uh, yet, th within the Saudi context, there's nothing particularly unusual about that. Uh, how did the religious uh, views manifest themselves early, and what were the influences on them in his early life? Well, they manifest themselves primarily because, as he was uh, growing up, he he did not succeed at, at college. He, he actually had a great deal of difficulty in the course which he was pursuing, which was one of, of finance. As you said, he's preparing to be a member uh, of, of the Bin Laden Construction Corporation, which is the biggest in all of Saudi Arabia. Um, but at the same time, he didn't, do, he didn't do very well as an engineering student. He wasn't really great in business courses. Uh, but he was along the way, uh, this is especially when he was in the, in, in the, in the mid to late 70s, he was t taking courses on the side, if you will, almost an auditor of religious courses, not for credit, and becoming more and more I intrigued by what it was that was motivating Saudi Arabia to be distinctive in the Muslim world. And a lot of the people who he found attractive were those who were saying Saudi Arabia had a role that was yet to be defined, and it wasn't by wealth, and it wasn't by oil income, and it wasn't by alliances to the West. It was as the leader for the Ummah, or the Muslim nation. And he was drawn to that idea of a Saudi role that was not, as it were, one among many, or one as a global partnership for a larger cause, but one that stood out for Islam only and Islam first. Who were the formative intellectual or religious influences on his thinking? I think the one that has been talked about a lot is Abdal Azam, and Abdal Azam was actually somebody he didn't meet till Afghanistan. And when one has to imagine that there were a lot of people who, whose books he refers to and poets whom he cites that he met in, in, in the circle of those people in Jeddah. And what, what's important to remember is he's from Jeddah, which is not the same sort of place as Riyadh or Dahran or certainly even as Mecca or Medina. 
So JIT is a port city where a lot of people come and traffic in ideas as well as in commercial goods. And so he doesn't give, as it were, a, um, a citation of all of those whom uh, he studied with or those people whose lectures he attended. But one has a definite feeling that among them was Muhammad Qutb, who was the older brother of Sayyid Qutb, who was teaching in Medi Medina Manawara, which is the uh, other major two cities of Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia, and drawing on them and, th and thinking about also this fellow Maududi, who comes from South Asia and from Pakistan and from the Jamaat Islami, all people who are trying to pioneer a specific and distinctive role for Islam as the dominant ideology of the modern world. So this is the through line in the influences that you find on bin Laden. That is to say, uh, Islam in a vanguard role, in a leadership and dominant role in the global community, uh, extending over Muslims and then over people who are not Muslim. Yes, but beginning first of all with Arab Muslims. And I think one of the things that's really important for people to understand is he not only comes out of a Saudi context, but he also has as I said, a Syrian mother, but a Yemeni father who migrates. And people might say, well, once you become a citizen, aren't you all the same? After all, that is or should be the case in the United States. But Yemenis, especially those from Hadramaut, which is a place in South Yemen, play a distinctive role in the economy, as it were, the Arab and larger Muslim world. And it's important to remember that he felt this, he felt this both attachment to Yemen, a, certain, a connection there that, that really went through his father, but in some way superseded his father, and that that tie to um, a, a part of the world that was both regional, because it's just a subset of the Arabian Peninsula, but cosmopolitan, because Yemenis traveled all throughout Africa, all throughout South Asia, and all the way to Southeast Asia. So if you will, he had a kind of um, parochial training, but a global worldview from a very early age.